Hold on, sugar. Daddy's got a sweet guide. All right. <laughs> Ooh, somebody stop me. The most powerful weapon we can equip our battleships with is a spinal mount weapon. But which spinal mount weapon should we be using? In this video, I'm going to be presenting you with the results of some tests I've conducted to find out the answer to that very question. In addition, a little bit later on, I'll also be looking at which is the best war doctrine to be using with our battleships equipped with these spinal mount weapons, specifically when they're fighting other battleships equipped with spinal mount weapons, which is very, very common in the late game. So let's have a look at some ship designs. To keep these tests balanced, the ship designs are basically identical with the only change being the spinal mount weapon that we have. First, we're going to look at the Tachyon Lance. That's going to be equipped here on our battleship and we're going to have three neutron launchers and a kinetic artillery with this. The reason I've got the neutron launchers and kinet a single kinetic artillery is this was the results of the previous video I did where I tested the L-slot weapons to find out which type of artillery weapon is the best one to use. And this combination of kinetic artillery, a single one of those with neutron launchers, turned out to be the most powerful overall. So I'm going to be using that in all of my designs. In addition, we've got the artillery combat computer. We've got two auxiliary computers just to increase our hit chance. We've got as many shields as we can grab in there, which is three uh, level five shields. We could squeeze out some more shields by reducing our thrusters, but that's not something I've done here. Here I've tried to keep it balanced. In addition, I've thrown in three crystal hull plates. Well, crystal hull plates are generally going to be better than armor plating. The reason for that partly and mainly is cost. Crystal hull plates are something you're going to probably have found, well hopefully have found by this late stage in the game where you've got these very powerful artillery battleships and it's going to cost no alloys and give you quite a lot of health. The other option I could include here instead of the plating is armor and armor is going to cost me an extra 300 alloys on my battleships. In terms of cost effectiveness you really want to be using the crystal hull plating at this late stage in the game. If you would like me to do a full analysis video on exactly why that is, comment down below and maybe I can check that out. So the other two battleship designs will each have the focused arc emitter and the giga cannon. Those are the three X slot weapons we have at our disposal. Let's take a look at some results. First off, how did the arc emitter do against the other two weapon slots? Well, against the other two weapon types, the arc emitter lost really badly. We're looking at around uh, taking taking somewhere in the region of 60 to 65 percent losses and only inflicting around 20 to 25 percent depending on the weapon type. Here the Tachyon Lance actually did slightly better than the Giga Cannon against those battleships but the error on this is actually such that they're, they're quite close. So how did the Tachyon Lance do against the Giga Cannon? Well in this engagement it was quite a close one. Uh, the losses were very similar on both sides, but the Tachyon Lance actually did slightly worse than the Giga Cannon. So here I saw that the Giga Cannon kind of took around 45 to 50% losses and inflicted almost 60% on the Tachyon Lance fleet. But is this because of the crystal hull plating? Well, I removed the crystal hull plating and I replaced that with armor. And this is the ship design here, you can see. So with that ship design, who came out on top? Well, in this case, with balanced fleets of the equal numbers, the Tachyon Lance actually came out on top and did more damage to the Giga Cannon fleet. We're looking at around 65% losses taken by the Giga Cannon fleet and around 45 to 50% losses taken by the Tachyon Lance fleet. But it's really important to note here that each battleship armed with a Tachyon Lance here cost over 1,700 alloys as opposed to only 1,400, 1,450. So when I compared the two fleets to make them of equal resources, which ended up being 17 battleships with Tachyon Lance against 20 battleships with the Giga Cannon, the Giga Cannon wiped the floor again with the Tachyon Lance fleet. So the problem here really is that yes, Tachyon Lance will beat Giga Cannon in a straight up engagement, but the resources required to do so 
mean that the Giga Cannon is the better weapon. Over a long enough period of time, the economics of the warfare will mean that the Tachyon Lance fleets, which cost more to build with the armor to counter the Giga Cannon, you're not going to be able to build as many of them. You're going to be performing worse overall, and that will mean that the Giga Cannon is the better weapon. So of these three, of these tests I've done, it's kind of conclusive that the Giga Cannon is the one you want to be running with. The, the negatives to it, uh, the, the counters to it, really only give negatives to the people attempting to counter them. There, there's really an issue here. So I would recommend you run fleets of Giga Cannons with neutron launchers on your battleships with a single kinetic artillery. Although, having said that, you might actually be able to swap that kinetic artillery out for another neutron launcher. Uh, as you've already got the Giga Cannon pounding against shields, it's really possible you want to swap that over. But that's not something I tested here. I wanted to keep all of the fleets balanced. So there's something people have been asking me as well. They've been asking me to try out the focused arc committer with a bunch of cloud lightning. And that is something I've looked at, but I'm going to cover that at the end of the video. First, I'm going to look at the war doctrines you're going to want to run on your battleships and a comparison between the war doctrines to see, in this case, which war doctrine is going to be the best to use. So what are our war doctrines? What can we take? Well, starting at the top, we have defense in depth. Now that's going to give us a plus 10% fire rate bonus in home territory. However, as all of these tests are conducted in neutral territory, then that's really going to do nothing for our engagement. So for the purposes of this, I'm going to be using defense in depth as our control, which we can compare the others against. Next is a common one I've looked at a lot, and that's hit and run. Hit and run is going to increase your combat disengagement chance by 33% and also reduce the emergency FTL damage you take by 25%, or the, the risk of taking damage and losing the ship by 25%. Hit and run is very much a double-edged sword in, in as much as if your ships retreat, yes, they won't be taking damage, but they also won't be able to deal damage. So you'll find that your fleet will disappear more quickly in an equal engagement. Though this war doctrine can be used to devastating effect by skillful play. Third, we have rapid deployment. That's going to increase your sublight speed by 25%, but more importantly, it'll give you a weapons range bonus of 10%. In this case, because I'm not doing kiting, I'm not attempting to do anything like that, which, uh, which is probably something you do want to be doing, but for the purposes of these tests, it's not something I feel I can repeat, so I haven't looked at that. But if you're not doing kiting, ship's weapon, ra weapon range is going to give you a first strike capability against your opponent. In this kind of engagement, that can be pretty devastating. And finally, there is no retreat. This one is only available if you have the militarist ethic or if you also are a gestalt consciousness. What does it do? Well, it gives you a 33% fire rate bonus, but also it gives you a plus 100% disengagement chance reduction, which should mean, and does mean, your ships cannot disengage. The fire rate bonus of 33%, that is really good though. That's going to increase the amount of times you're firing. In every, uh, what would be three shots, you'll have fired four shots. So let's jump in and see what the results are. If you've been enjoying this video and other videos on my channel, please consider subscribing. It will help get my videos out to other players like you. At this point in the game, as no retreat is really the contender to beat, I'm going to be comparing a fleets with that war doctrine to other fleets. And what happened? Well, when no retreat came up against no uh, war doctrine used, and this is also no retreat and the range admiral equipped as well, well, against a fleet which had an admiral, but it was the upkeep admiral. So nothing really important. This is our baseline. And this is the defense in depth war doctrine, which in neutral space is nothing. So here we found that uh, defense in depth took around 60% casualties and only inflicted around 20% to no retreat. Hit and run, on the other hand, we had slightly less losses taken by the hit and run fleet. And they also had a trickster admiral but actually they inflicted slightly less losses. But overall, you know, I, I really wouldn't recommend, it seems, taking hit and run at this late stage in the game. On the other hand, rapid deployment came out of the gate swinging. They almost went toe to toe with no retreat. No retreat won all of these engagements, I should add as well, all of the engagements, but rapid deployment 
did inflict a significant number of casualties. Now, if you were able to kite the rapid deployment fleet with their extra range, you're going to find that the initial alpha strike from the rapid deployment will be massively reduced and you probably won't get these results. But without doing that, uh, for instance, if you're coming up against an AI who isn't going to be doing that, you're gonna be finding that rapid deployment works toe to toe. But that was only looking at equal engagements. What happens if we come up against a fleet which is larger than our fleet or smaller than our fleet? Which is really in Stellaris, the majority situation you're going to find is not one of equal engagements. For the purposes of testing the weapons, I'd like to use equal engagements so we can find out which is better. But when I'm testing these war doctrines, I want to see the efficacy of them across a variety of situations. So what have I done? Well, I've reduced the number of ships on one side by 25%. I've, I've reduced them by uh, about a quarter. And what has that done to our overall numbers? Well, first off, I reduced the no retreat fleet by a quarter. And even at this point, actually, they had very similar fleet strength to the other fleets they were engaging. Against the defense in depth, the none, the no retreat fleet won between 40 to 50% of their engagements. However, whenever they lost, they lost all of their ships, which is the main issue here with no retreat. So that meant over many engagements, the no retreat fleet took higher casualties than the none fleet, the fleet with uh, defense in depth. Now also something to note here about this graph, the losses here aren't as a percentage, these are absolute number of battleships lost because we've got forces of different size. Comparing the percentage losses, I don't think would give correct results. We actually really care about the number of ships lost because from an economic point of view, we want to keep our losses to a minimum to win any wars. So then when we included hit and run, well, what did we see? We saw an increase in the losses for the no retreat fleet. It's because they actually lost more engagements. And in addition to that, the hit and run fleet with the trickster admiral, they lost fewer ships. So even this high level with neutron launchers and tachyon lances and giga cannons, hit and run is still reducing our casualties. And then finally, against the rapid deployment fleet, it was a complete trouncing. The no retreat fleet lost every single engagement. That's why they've got the full 15 here because they didn't win a single one and they only inflicted minor losses to the rapid deployment fleet. So this fleet with extra artillery range. We did somewhat expect the no retreat fleet to lose here, though it does highlight one of the key issues is that when they lose, they lose big because you lose the entire fleet. So let's look at what happens when when the force disparity goes in the other direction. Well, when it goes in the other direction, when we take away 25% of the other fleets, so we keep 100% of the no retreat ships, what we see is that no retreat wins overall. They do win all of their engagements, which we can expect them to have done. They, they won the engagements previously. They would have continued to win here against smaller fleets. But what we do see here is that hit and run, as opposed to the uh, defense in depth, does cause you to have fewer losses, although the fewer the, the loss reduction is very, very small. You're talking on average around a quarter of a battleship out of uh, out of around 15 battleships. So that's really nothing you want to be celebrating. On the other hand, rapid deployment did do quite well against the no retreat still, and rapid deployment still managed to inflict actually quite a few casualties against the no retreat ships. And if you compare that to when the force disparity was the other way around, it's quite clear that rapid deployment was able to inflict more casualties and take fewer casualties. So over a long enough number of engagements and engagements of different sizes and different volumes with different force disparities, I would expect rapid deployment to outperform no retreat. So really, you either want to be running no retreat or rapid deployment on these battleships. Unless you're fighting in a highly defensive war and then perhaps defense in depth is going to be helpful for that extra 10% bonus to fire rate inside your territory. And finally, what happened when we had our Cloud Lightning Archimeter battleships up against our other two types of battleships? Well, they lost pretty badly. Yep, they lost really quite badly, inflicting around 
10 to 20% of the casualties on the enemy fleet that they themselves took. I did, however, then attempt to look at the economic difference here because there's a 400 alloy difference in the cost of a Cloud Lightning with Archimeter battleship as opposed to a Giga Cannon or Tachyon Lance battleship with your Neutron launchers and that one kinetic artillery. But when I compare that and look at 15, uh, it was 15 against 20 was the ended up uh, ship written numbers to keep it uh, fair in terms of economics. That still ended up with the Cloud Lightning Archimetal battleships losing and again losing badly. Not losing as badly as before, so it's possible you could run them, but don't expect them to be able to outperform Tachyon Lances or Mega Cannons with Neutron Launchers and Kinetic Artillery. The economic advantage of the cheaper ships is outweighed by their inability to actually perform and deal damage. I hope this can close a chapter in the people who are really quite interested in seeing how Cloud Lightning does and the ARC emitters. Yes, they do bypass the shields and armor, but they still aren't doing as well as tachyon lances and the like, and uh, your regular energy and kinetic weapons. In summary, the Giga Cannon is the best weapon you're going to want to equip on your artillery battleships, followed closely by the tachyon lance, and then finally the focused Archimeter is the worst of the three. In addition, the war doctrines you're going to want to run are either the no retreat, although you'll have to be very careful to not engage the enemy when you are weaker. And in addition to that, you could also try running the rapid deployment. That extra artillery range is going to be really useful for getting an alpha strike in if you can. And really, try not to run Cloud Lightning. It won't go well in multiplayer games against player ships or against something like the Starnet AI, which is producing quite strong battleships. This wraps it up for this video. If you've enjoyed it, please leave a like. If you have any feedback, please leave a comment. And if you'd like to see more content like this, please subscribe. In addition, if you'd like to support this channel, there's a link to Patreon down below in the description.